In the next of our Deep 90s episodes here in the Levity Zone, we again join Derek Malevsky for two hilltop discussions on Hermit Knob in the Bear Creek Valley amongst the redwood and oak forests of the Santa Cruz Mountains. The first interview is from August of 1995, less than a year after I had moved to my tiny cabin after months on the road seeking my future path. I had just hosted the first formation and brainstorming meetings of the Contact Consortium, a nonprofit community organization I established to help catalyze a whole new medium, internet-based virtual worlds, inhabited by users digitally dressed as avatars. People in cyberspace, what a concept. In contrast to the rather pedestrian solo page surfing of the World Wide Web, Back in May of that year, World's Chat, the first 3D world, had come online and by the end of August we would see the quiet launch of Alpha World, the first shared world in which users could build. I derived part of my dream from Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash cyberpunk classic of the early 90s. I believed that these worlds would become a brand new medium for human contact and community, and that could even help remake the default world. That dream is still being realized today with continuous generations of online gaming and social worlds, VR, and now augmented reality. Join us now for these two conversations about the state of virtual worlds in their earliest infancy. I will return midway through to introduce the second conversation with Darek, a follow-up from March of 1996. And as you will hear, a lot happened in those intervening months, including the planting of a whole virtual forest. I'm speaking with Bruce Daimer, a computer naturalist from Boulder Creek. We're sitting right now on the top of Hermit Knob, somewhere near Boulder Creek. It is an appropriate place to talk about inhabitable worlds or virtual worlds. Bruce, what is this idea about? Well, if if many of you out there are net surfers or internet majors or minors, you'll notice that when you're there, you're kind of alone. Unless you're in a chat room where other people typing, it's a ghost town. And uh, what this whole idea of an inhabitable digital space is, is that you'll start seeing people on the internet. People represented as sort of colorful bit patterns or personae, sometimes called avatars, where it might be their face moving around or the body they choose. And they're in a space, and the space might be for chat, where you can move yourself around from your point of view. Or it might be for work, or it might be for education or job postings, or just kind of a a way to populate the Internet with the people who are already out there, but to represent them somehow and let them interact. So it means that I can become anyone that I want? I can pretend to be someone else? This is, this is a good social question. In fact, this is why uh, we formed the Contact Consortium. Because, you know, if you were a man, you could pick a, a voluptuous woman character and shift around through the space and make various body moves and gestures and postures and, and really trick people into thinking you're someone that you're not. And... No, this is a very deep social question. It's not just like a masquerade ball where you can pull a mask off and suddenly you know, they can sort of see that it's you anyway. And so, yes, this is, this is a problem. So when you go into this uh, virtual space, this inhabitable world, what do you exactly do there? I mean, do you talk with these other people and, and how do you talk with them if, if you have no microphone? To talk with the other people who are sort of standing there in this virtual, most of the time, three-dimensional room, you type at the bottom of the screen and it puts your little posting of what you've set up next to your your chosen name. And often your character has a sign sort of unfashionably pasted on the top of of its head. Um, These are very crude worlds in the beginning, but there are some systems, one being used for sick children in hospitals where they've got enough power in the network to have microphones because these kids can't type. They can barely move the mouse, some of them. So they're speaking, it's coming through their character. It might be a cartoon character in a a sky world, a system that's being put together uh, at the moment for these kids so that they're perhaps getting a little bit more of the future now than the rest of us can at home. So there is a real-life application already of this system. Can you give us more details? 
This was a, a, a digital and habitable world built by a company called Worlds Incorporated in partnership with Steven Spielberg's Starbright Foundation, which creates dreams for kids who are really sick in hospitals, who may never come out of hospitals. It's one of the best uses of donated time from actors and actresses to go and see those kids to make these kids' dreams come true. And this is being put together by a series of partners like Intel and Sprint and UB Networks that came together and they, they made this, this world. And it's going to be online at five pediatric hospitals in, in November. And the kids that are already using it are, are bright and active. They may not be able to get out of their beds, but they can see the monitor and they can move a mouse around and shift around. They can interact with other kids through this world. They can play in the world. They can get a little video picture of what the other kids look like at the other hospital. I presume they could also interact with people at home. They're part of a community. They're not shut away somewhere. So they can also interact with E.T. and other unreal creatures. In fact, in, in that world, they sort of don the costumes of characters like E.T. or a, a samurai bunny, and they present themselves to the other kids this way. Uh, I'm not sure if they're outsiders playing roles in there. I think it's all the kids, and the kids have built their own community. and They've reduced their use of painkillers, and they're not focused on their condition as much. And the kids are also actually able to request characters, and they're designed by animators. So they, they get a personally designed character. Because they don't want to be seen as themselves. I mean, they want to be seen as something dramatic, you know, like a samurai bunny or something like that. So it's no longer curiosity and uh, an experiment. It's a real-life application. Any other examples of that? Yeah, there's um, a couple of these digital worlds on the net. There are companies doing virtual factory walkthroughs now where they have two people in there with their points of view and they can walk through a model of a factory before they build it. So they can put a little man figure digitally underneath a tank with a valve and, and find out if the man can reach the valve. It's important. You know, if there's an emergency, they can reach a shutoff valve. And all the collaborative conferences are being designed and conceived of where you have people can carry documents so they don't have to fly all over the world and just to sit and watch a computer present something or review documents. They can have the feeling that they're there but not with the tremendous cost and inconvenience of getting there. Of course, this can't and shouldn't and mustn't replace personal contact, uh, but certainly it can cut down on wasted time commuting and flying and, and allow people to work from home more effectively and just not become exhausted on business trips. What are the social implications of this invention? You said that uh, they shouldn't cut human interaction but in fact, uh, they can. They can do that. In fact, speculative fiction writers uh, sort of think these things through for us. William Gibson's Neuromancer 10 years ago and recently Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, they really pointed out a whole culture built around these inhabitable digital worlds. And often the characters in those books were donning headgear and they're really utterly immersed in the world. And some of them were, had no social interaction outside of those, those worlds. And that, that occurs now. That occurs with people who play net games or, or sit at home on, on the net. You know, perhaps we have created a very isolating society and that you know, people feel unsafe about going out in, into the street and just talking to someone or even talking to their neighbor. And Perhaps it's a bigger society issue. It, it's a symptom of things we've done wrong in our communities. The virtual, the inhabitable world, how do they differ from uh, the headgear that you put on in a video archive and pay $15 for two minutes or so and uh, pretend that you are somewhere else? How does this differ? Yeah, you know, the appeal of this new type of digital space is that you don't need the headgear. You just have a window on your Mac or PC or workstation that's showing the 3D world, just like a 3D computer game, and use the mouse to move around, and you don't need the glasses. It certainly is less compelling and immersive, but the average office worker is not going to put on a data glove and a, and a helmet every day. Maybe stock market tr currency traders in the future will need those helmets, and physicians or whoever, very specialized people, but there are a lot of problems with that type of gear and it isn't really that necessary to start using this kind of stuff. So today we have the beginning of this virtual world. What's next? 
I think that you're going to see the natural trend of people having control over their own time and lives by being able to work at home. This will only be accelerated tremendously by this. For the people who benefit from this, it'll make it possible to really operate a network of people all over the world in a tight fashion and be able to, to get things done and to be able to do any kind of service much more efficiently. You know, would you rather go to the bank and stand in a queue to get a form to fill out for a loan application or zoom through a virtual bank where you meet real bank officers who are sitting there and give you advice and, and the file is automatically sent to you to look at and you just do it in, in a five-minute period when your tea is boiling? Wouldn't you have to wait in queue if there's someone in front of you? Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, an eternal question of the Internet is, is the load. If you look at the first worlds of this type that have appeared on the net, uh, they get pretty burdened. I mean, everybody wants to get in there. So because it's a social human space, we'll probably have to have a virtual queue with your avatar waiting there. The benefit to all that is, that, of course, you can sort of minimize that window and go on and do some more work, and then the, you know, a voice will say, may I help you, and your avatar is at the front of the line, so you don't have to physically wait in that queue. You can just sort of virtually wait it out. Virtually waiting. Okay. Uh, you just started a consortium that uh, deals especially with the technical and social or cultural issues related to uh, the inhabitable worlds. Um, can you tell us a little more about uh, the idea behind this consortium? Yeah, a group of us who have been involved for years with issues of culture, human culture and technology and contact issues, uh, contact challenges for our culture whether between us and some invented culture or us and, and each other or us and our technology, decided upon seeing this occurring in the Internet that this was actually going to come to reality years before everyone thought. We decided to form an organization that would marry the social sciences and the technologists and the business people who will build these worlds such that there will be richer places to be. For example, um, you know, we have specialists in primate studies who understand how to sign to orangutans, and they will be invaluable in helping to digital designers of digital personae to represent gestures in that environment. If you don't have gestures, you're missing a lot, and you're missing a lot of social cues. It won't feel real. You'll get insulted by mistake, or you'll insult people. You know, you're trying to represent a human community, in fact, and we don't really understand our own communities, let alone be able to create one from scratch. So the consortium will serve as a, a conference. Uh, we'll have a conference on this subject. We're talking to all the people who are building these worlds. We're talking to scientists and academics who have studied this, and we're going to create the forum to both catalyze the industry and make its birth so that the child may be smiling a little bit as he, he comes into the world. Roll your web counters forward from August of 1995 to March of 96 and hear how much has happened in the intervening months. My confidence and tone of voice belie a lot of new virtual landscapes opening up as Alpha World became populated with thousands of users who placed millions of objects into their personal digital homesteads. In January, I initiated the Contact Consortium's Sherwood Forest Town Project, the first collaborative building exercise in Avatar Cyberspace. In March, we held our first symposium at Contact Cultures of the Imagination, the conference of our mothership organization. In October of 96, we would hold our very own conference for 500 people called Earth to Avatars. At this event held in San Francisco, we would fully launch the new medium of virtual worlds into digital space. When we spoke last time, it was at the same location. It was Berkeley Valley. And it was also a sunny day. It was a few months ago. And we talked about virtual worlds. And since then, a lot of things changed in this virtual world. Yeah, in fact, the last six months, we've seen real virtual kingdoms or virtual immersive environments come on the internet. And uh, one of them was launched on August 31st, now has almost 50,000 registered citizens. 
and people have placed almost three million objects in the world, building everything from parklands to homes to statues to rivers that run up and down walls and all these kinds of things. Communities, bars, construction yards, museums. It's really been quite a magnificent explosion, sort of Cambrian explosion in digital space. Your organization, Contact Consortium, has recently sponsored a virtual forest building. It was called Sherwood Forest. Where did you get this idea to build a virtual forest in a virtual world? Our organization is made up of a lot of people who've spent time in natural settings, anthropologists, primate researchers, a lot of scientists and writers, and we felt that if we're going to study the beginnings of new human community, that we should go back to where we all came from, which is probably a, a forest land or, or meadows, at least open fields. And so we felt instead of these structures that look like outlet malls, which is very common in Elf World, they all look like outlet stores, you know, pink false fronts and things like that. We would build a, a forest land and, and have the human community start within that, that forest. So we put up about 300 trees and shrubs and a lot of lakes and streams and whatnot and placed sound in there, with forest sounds. And now uh, we're, we're getting ready to build a town. It could be a, an encampment. It could be a, a proper town or a medieval town. And uh, last Sunday, on March 24th, we had a whole lot of avatars come in, joined us at the front gate for a tour of the land, and for discussion, sort of a floating chat discussion of what we would build there. And we're planning to really start getting the construction underway on May 4th, this coming May. What did you find with this massive uh, human interaction? How did people behave building? Were they able to agree on where to put the tree? How did that social interaction work? Well, the interesting thing is that you can build in this world, uh, and another person can't move or touch or alter the objects you've placed down. So you actually have to agree to share a common cloak, a common uh, persona that is like one individual building. So you, there's a great deal of trust you have to have in this process, because someone could come in and one night and vandalize and all the work that's been done and take it apart. So the discussion we're having now with the avatar community is, and by the way, avatar is the, the way you look in digital space. It's your personal body wrapping, and it floats through the virtual environment you see on your computer screen. And you could be a cat or a, or a, a dragon or a young sexy girl or a you know, a crazy guy. You, you can really be seen as anything. But um, some, some individuals want to have the ability to just build in a chaotic fashion, to build a shanty town. And, and, and to mess around with everything. And others want to have specific plots that are assigned to them that they build on. How do you agree? Uh, is, is there a process of voting? Actually, there, uh, what we're going to do is build a town charter and have the, the town builders, the town fathers, just basically agree on rules that we'll follow and uh, see how that goes. I mean, it really just is a matter of trust because, in fact... In this town, uh, people don't live. The avatars don't stay there. When you log off, your avatar disappears, and the town spends most of its time abandoned. Then there's no virtual guard dogs there either. That would be a very good idea, actually. The virtual uh, Doberman. Um, but uh, we're just going to have to agree as a group, virtually, how to place the town down. In fact, we're going to compromise, and outside the city wall will be an area that will be a shanty town. will be chaotic. The, the red light district will be there. We've got, we've got to satisfy both communities because inside Alpha World, there are vandals, there are hooligans that come and wreck stuff. Uh, one by the name of King Punisher, who's the terrorizing Alpha World. And we have to be aware of King Punisher and his gang. You know, Robin Hood and his merry gang may come into contact. and There's probably a, a sheriff of Nottingham somewhere, too. Do you have an idea who this uh, vandal is? don't know. Uh, he or she, don't know really, has been seen vandalizing property, caught in the act, and basically a picture was taken. But it's difficult for someone to leave a note. You, if, if you, for instance, destroy a site by putting heaps of garbage on it, or big barricades, or flames, 
towers of flames that are, are burning visually on the screen. Some poor person's sight is in, in flames in the ring and the fires of hell. And uh, King Punisher would leave his name on the object. Each object he or she would place down. So that's how you could tell. It's kind of like the Pink Panther with the glove. So you have a world of rebellion in the virtual world. You have very sort of natural democracy there. What else is coming? Well, it's it's a grand experiment. Uh, of course, this started a couple of decades ago with text-based interaction on computers, and the first Unix system was, was built for this as a game for people to do this. And this has been going on. There are hundreds of such communities based on text chat, where you're just simply typing in, and you're seeing a thread of conversation. This year, they've become visual, where they're completely immersive visual environments. And the richness of that text chat has d- diminished. People are very focused on property and ownership and the way things look. So the merger of these two worlds, the, the social dynamism of the text world, in with the visual you know, enrapturement of the virtual world, is going to produce quite a milieu for human beings to interact And we had a meeting, a symposium recently, a physical symposium, where an anthropologist from Apple Computer, Bonnie Nardi, posed us the question, why are we doing this? Aren't we so disconnected from our natural world now and that we're really escaping? We, we can't take five minutes to introduce ourselves to our neighbor, but we'll spend 100,000 hours online. And perhaps this is a good question to ask, uh, why we're escaping into this. Um, I don't know the answer, but there's a real attraction for people to have instant communication with, with others, with strangers, and, and instant communication all over the planet. In the 1880s, the Secretary of Commerce said, yes, telephones are wonderful. Every city should have one. You know, They, they had no concept of the, the need for higher primates to reach out and touch another primate. And the, the most harmless way to do it is with words. And when you bring an avatar and a virtual world and property into it, it gets, it gets more uh, invested. Um, but this is perhaps a fundamental desire we all have. And if we feel afraid of our neighbors, maybe this is the only thing, the only option we have. But the avatars, they look canned. They look the same to you have only a certain number of, of avatars available. What do you think will happen if, you, if we have the ability to put our physique into Avatar, so we are truly who we are. Will this still be the same, this, this easiness in interaction with uh, strangers? In fact, they have scanners now that can scan around your entire body and take exactly your face and model it onto it. And this type of Avatar is, is too massive for the Internet to deliver, but it will come. In Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, which is considered a seminal work for this type of thing, it's a fictional work, but it's very pressing and very deeply thought through. His rule was that your avatar in digital space could never be taller than you were in real life uh, because he predicted that people would use height, and the height is perhaps the key factor of dominance, hence the, the power of the person on horseback. Yeah, this is a very open question. Would you want to be seen? Many people who are handicapped or physically disfigured love being online because they can have open and free communication for the first time in their lives. And so they perhaps wouldn't want to be seen as they really are physically. That's sad. That's, uh, this is the way for us to allow to reach out to the neighbor across the street that we have to go to this virtual world to do it with an ease. What do you think causes this? I think that The century, the, the most unfortunate thing that has happened is another virtual medium has really conquered the human mind and the human attention. That's television. And it is immersive. It pulls your emotion. It's more powerful than the Internet. It's not interactive, but it has done tremendous damage. If you watch you know, 100,000 hours a year of news reports that tell you that your neighborhood is full of gangs and, and violence and women are always being chased by assailants, and, you know, that's a deep programming, and that's made us very fearful. And surprisingly, moving here to the Redwood Forest, you know, it took me about a year to sort of cast that off, to learn that if somebody made eye contact with you in downtown Boulder Creek and waved at you, it wasn't that they were going to attack you or anything. It was just that that's the way people are here. 
So I think that if this kind of medium can pull people away from TV and away from the view of the world that TV gives us, it will be good. It perhaps isn't a substitute for going and talking to the neighbor and taking your dog for a walk, though. Can't you take a virtual dog for a walk? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, there's a movement that's starting uh, to put animal and animate forms in virtual worlds. Because if you go into Alpha World, the trees are there. They're very nice, but they don't grow. They don't lose their leaves. There are no seasons. There's no weather. Uh, there are no dogs. There are no bugs. No birds. And uh, there's a movement that says there should be a mechanism to make things that look like they're alive. You know, perhaps they are computer viruses born in 3D and just fluttering around. Other artificial life, those kinds of things. That we really, as, as animals and as creatures born of this biosystem, if it doesn't have creepy crawly things moving around, it doesn't really feel like a real place. Don't you think that idea of this virtual world of being able to live almost really there it comes deeply from our longing for a paradise? That Could it be a paradise? Yeah, in fact, this is a topic that's come up at the consortium meetings a lot because in a sense, you know, you're back to the old Greek ideal of building a utopia from the layout of the town to the social rules in it and it can be clean and it, it can be a, a real utopia. It's a fabrication, but it, it's very, very attractive. And the idea also of creating new social movements, of creating, a, you know, not to say a revolution or communism or a new, a new uh, church, but to create a group, a grouping of people and to fabricate a shared idea, I think that that's also a, f a fundamental dream of the human primate. And the, the virtual world lets you play with that. It's a simulation, but certainly the, the communication's real. I mean, you're c not communicating with a software robot, you're communicating with the person. How deeply invested you are emotionally or spiritually in that is a good question. What are the dangers of living this kind of life? Mm. You mentioned that you met uh, Steve, no, uh, Steve Roberts, Steve Roberts uh, who lives his life on a bicycle, on a monstrous uh, computerized uh, bicycle. Uh, he mentioned something about his fear of being too digital. What was this? This is very interesting, and this is a man who has lived for years on these high-tech bicycles. He's, he's known as a technomad. He's sort of the father of the technomad movement, nomads who are very tech and very connected. He has a helmet that he wears with a heads-up display where he, he looks through basically glass and can see his computer screen, but can also see the outside world. So he's cycling through a town somewhere in the Midwest. He's a very pretty girl. And his eyes move over to this girl, of course, but his eyes also control what the mouse is going. So the mouse sails over and lands on top of the girl. And uh, his immediate reaction is to, to click, you know, to click to pick the girl. So here's the man totally immersed in, in the real world, but the mental space that he's in and carrying around is, is a virtual space. And Steve's a very, very careful, having ridden probably 100,000 miles on these bikes. Um, but other people have been completely immersed in their heads from dealing in digital mediums, have walked out and been run over by trucks because they're just not aware of what's going on around them. After eight hours of laying down sod tiles in Alpha World, digital sod tiles on the floor of our property as the basis for the forest, I came out here to the scout camp to hike and met the Ranger John. I, my immediate reaction was, Ranger John, see that piece of concrete and that sod there? Well, just pick that up and copy it and move it over and place it down and you'll get more land for the scouts. You, know, you really get completely sucked in. You really get immersed. It's different than just surfing the web or typing in emails. This grabs a whole lot more neurons in your brain, and it, it, it exhausts you also physically. It, it's, it's a very dramatically different experience than normal internet activity. Where can people start uh, looking through the virtual world? What's the URL where they can find you? What we're trying to do, the, the contact consortium is trying to be a nexus of information and issue building around this new mediums, and you can find us at www.cconn dot org and we have links instructions on how to download these worlds links to the organizations that have built them we have a lot of photographs or stills or reportage from experiences in the worlds and uh, articles papers research on the theme on our website thank you so much for speaking with uh, an alternative media view you're very welcome and welcome to digital space 
Thanks for hiking with us 20 years back down this long trail to the deep 90s, when pioneers sought to colonize the new visual landscapes of the internet. We will return with one or two more episodes of this treasured part of my past, when your Dr. Bruce walked the virtual plane as DigiGardener, the digital gardener, a kind of Johnny Appleseed of cyberspace. Thanks again, Bo Millward, for cleaning up the cassette recordings so kindly provided by Darek Milewski from his alternate media view program for KALX Berkeley. See you next time on The Levity Zone.